All righty. So it is 12.59. We can begin getting started at, the, at this time. So good afternoon. I'm Corinne Stoll, and I'm with the Center for Distributed Learning. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Active Learning Across Modalities, Tec Techniques for Fostering Active Learning in Online Courses, part of UCF's faculty seminars in, in online teaching. If you haven't already responded to the poll question on screen, as Jessica said, please feel free to do so at this time. And so our intention in each of these 30-minute seminars is to provide a brief treatment of a topic relevant to online teaching. This is not intended to be a comprehensive workshop with extensive detail about active learning and online courses. Rather, the aim is to connect our participants to an array of strategies, tools, and resources for more detailed follow-up. We believe that today's seminar will be successful if you walk away with at least one new idea that you can put into action in your online teaching. I would like to acknowledge the participants on site with us here today in UCF's Faculty Multimedia Center, as well as those participating online via YouTube Live. Our, our online participants are in good hands with our online moderators and John Pizzo ensuring technical quality. In the feedback form for today's session, feel free to share any unanswered questions that you may have or any <laughs> relevant ideas or resources that would benefit others, and we'll follow up with these after the session. So with that, please, welcome, please join me in welcoming today's speakers, Drs. Jessica Weishi and Anjali Namhornchai. Thank you, Corinne. Well, I believe that no one actually never known about active learning. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for participating. Um, so my, so my name is Anshali Ngam Chai. so um, thank you everyone for coming today and also those who join us virtually. So today we're going to cover the um, concept of active learning. We will identify the benefits of active learning for students and then we, we will discuss active learning strategies and tools, especially for online courses. Before I go further, can we have another poll? So please participate. The question is, which of these reflects your most concern or curiosity? No one really care about the effectiveness of, on, <laughs> of active <laughs> learning, apparently. <laughs> Everybody That's believes it works. It works, <laughs> it works. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much for, participa for participating. Um, of course, all of these topics are very important, and we hope to uh, cover all, or maybe some. If we cannot cover all of them, I hope that the conversation continues beyond today. When Jessica and I actually prepare for this presentation, we have an assumption that many of you have already used active learning techniques in your classroom. And we also talk about assumptions that we, and perhaps many of you have, about active learning in general, too. And so I would like to um, talk about active learning today based on these assumptions. So the first assumption that many of us heard, many of you might hold, is that active learning is a new trend. Well, active learning classroom, or ALC, might be a new trend. In fact, according to EduCourse report that just came out last week, identified that active learning classroom is actually number two on the top 10 IT trend for higher ed. But the idea or the concept of, ac of active learning actually is not very really new. In fact, one of the articles that I read talk about the fact that active learning actually is older than lecturing. So active learning usually is defined as learning by engaging in meaningful activities, or the ones that the learners take increasing responsibility for their learning. Well, for this, the idea of active learning is actually is a simple concept that describes the implication for instruction from theories and concepts in education psychology, for example, cognitive information processing or CIP that talks about or deals with the memories. How can we move um, the new knowledge from the short-term memory into the long-term memories? CIP suggests that knowledge retention 
requires students to practice in different situations. It also asks that they organize the concept in a meaningful way. It requires students to actually connect the new concept to the existing ones. So CIP advocates for activities such as concept mapping, visual organization of concepts, and advanced organizers. Metacognition refers to the, the awareness of one's own thinking and learning. We develop metacognition over time, and with it, we become better learners. That's why adult learners are or have advanced metacognition than the children or the um, younger ones. Activities su such as group-based activities or peer mentoring foster the development of metacognition. Discovery learning is just the opposite of receptive learning. It argued that um, learning happen, happen when the learners are guided to discover things by themselves. And so this group suggests that instructors should take the role of the facilitator instead of the expert, the guides instead of the says on the stage. Situated cognition emphasizes learning environment or the culture of the particular knowledge that is happening. It says that knowledge and its environment are inseparable. Therefore, they emphasize the participation, active participation in the community and also the community of practice. So these concepts or theories are really the foundation for active learning that we are discussing now, today. Many also argue that active learning stems from constructivism. Well, constructivists believe that knowledge or um, reality is so socially and culturally constructed. Researchers or the, um, f oh, sorry. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> Um, um, philosophers like Vygotsky talk about authentic setting and um, John Dewey, for another example, advocate for problem-based learning <coughs> and active inquiry. So I talk, I review this concept and the philosophies just to make sure that we un understand that active learning is not a new trend. So let's move on to another assumption about active learning. Some people say that students learn very really little from activities. It is a waste of time. Well, this might be a misconception that based on the idea that active learning has to involve some sort of playing, a big activities. Well, sometimes playing, actually most of the time playing leads to learning. But the point is that when we pick the activity, we have to actually try to fulfill a certain learning goal. So active learning should not be a waste of time for you or for your student. Another assumption is that active learning takes time to prepare. Or oh, there's some truth to that. Some activities actually require time to prepare. However, there's also a lot of active learning techniques or strategies that take very really little time or no time at all. And that leads me to the spec spectrum or the continuum that um, display Learning, uh, active learning technique, from simple to complex. The simple techniques are the ones that require really little preparation, and the complex ones require more time to prepare. For example, the simplest technique is the pausing. Pausing for reflection, or pausing for questions. Pausing, in fact, really allows your student to do the deep processing of the new idea. And with that, maybe I should pause <laughs> and allow you to take a look at these techniques to see if you already have implemented any technique in your class or if you plan or are curious about any of these. And Jessica will actually talk about a few of these later on, too. So let's, let me move on to the next assumption about active learning. And this goes like, active learning can only be done face to face. Well, it is not really, right? Because we can apply active learning techniques into an online environment pretty well. I have two quotes here from the authors that um, talk about online education in particular, really. 
I'm not going to read the text. But the main idea that they are arguing is that online education or online technologies actually put the student into the role of active learner. For instructors, we will have to facilitate that mindset or facilitate that active learning mindset. Long lecture, for example, proved not to work very well in an online environment. Presented here is, is a UCF modalities that we use. Right? Many of you are very familiar with the W mode, which is 100% online. M mode is a mixed mode, mixed modality. But P is a face-to-face -face class. And RA is a new modality that stands for reduce time active learning. Very similar to mixed mode because it combines both online and face-to-face. -face. But the RA, the 80% of the activities will be online and the 20% will be in the classroom and they have to implement active learning techniques. So anyone have been to the sandbox or the active learning classroom we have right here ar ar around the corner? Um, well, the idea of active learning classroom is that there is no podium. There is no, you know, we, we set up so that the instructor will become the facilitator. And the movable furniture will facilitate student collaboration, do project-based learning, do problem-based learning. The idea here is that without a physical classroom, we still can do active learning anywhere even on the um, online environment. At the end of the day, we come, we come back and we ask what is in it for students, right? So research shows that active learning really helps students to be more engaged in the lesson. It helps them to better connect the concept that they learn, the new concept connect with the existing ones. In fact, one of the research um, in the biology class shows that active learning help reduce the failure, rate, the failure rate of disadvantaged students, women and uh, students of color. Active learning also help them develop more critical, th critical thinking and analytical skills. It help them um, develop better communication and leadership skills because they're gonna have to work on the case studies in the real world scenarios and also work in group quite a bit. Lastly, it also helped the student develop um, learner autonomy and metacognition. With that, I would like to pass on to Jessica. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some examples of how I use active learning when I teach my classes online. I'm a lecturer in the psychology department and just to give you a sense of my teaching experience, I split my time between teaching undergraduate classes and teaching classes in our master's in clinical psychology program. My undergraduate classes that I teach have all been online since uh, my, my very first semester here at UCF. I've been here, I'm in my sixth year now. My very first semester I taught one face-to-face -face undergraduate class. Since then, all of my <laughs> undergraduate classes have been online. So I've had several years now to kind of get the hang of teaching online. Um, and one of the questions or one of the options in the poll we asked you was um, you're interested in teaching um, active learning online, but also teaching large classes. My class sizes are about 125. So that's the perspective that I'm coming from and telling you about some of the techniques that I use. Um, so first of all, with active learning for online classes, use technology to help you. That's why the technology is there, and especially in an online course, students are expecting this. And we have a lot of really great tools in web courses, um, and so I'm gonna talk about several of these today, including Materia, there's an option of embedding polls in your web course, uh, discussion boards, and again, especially with large classes, using the small groups feature within the discussion boards. Um, you can do surveys that are non-graded or anonymous. Um, and so I'll be talking about examples of all of those. A couple of other things that I haven't tried yet, but I know that other faculty really like, are doing peer review where students submit assignments and then they review each other's. 
um, and also doing collaborations. Google Docs is now embedded into web courses so students can collaborate on a document together. So probably my very favorite of all of those things is Materia. Uh, Materia is a UCF created integration and basically it creates graded games. Um, and the scores import directly into your gradebook in Canvas in web courses. Um, the Materia game embeds directly into your course, so your students don't have to leave web courses. They just click on the link for it within your course, they uh, complete the activity, and then the grade populates into the gradebook. The website for it, if you're not familiar, is materia.ucf.edu. Um, and there's uh, a whole bunch of help resources if you need help with embedding it into your course and that sort of thing. But the reason why I really like Materia is because it helps with practicing some of the more basic ideas or skills within your course. We all know that we have various levels of things that we want to test and reinforce in our courses. And so Materia, I think, is particularly good for some of the more basic skills, more basic terminology, things like that. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple examples of what you can do with Materia. This is one of my favorites, creating a crossword puzzle. And so all you have to do as the faculty member is type in the clues that get shown over here on the side, and then you type in what the word is that they're supposed to fill in, and Materia generates all of the rest of this for you. So you don't have to build a crossword puzzle yourself. You just come up with the clues and the words, feed them in, and it creates this nice visual for you. Another one that I use is Hangman. And so in this one, you can see um, I actually go a little bit beyond just a simple definition and ask more of an applied question. And so my question here says, Zoe's desk drawer is locked and she has also lost the key. She has a dish of paper clips on her desk, but doesn't realize she could use a paper clip to unlock the desk drawer. She is experiencing, and so the students have to think about the terminology that they know and come up with the idea that this is describing what we call functional fixedness. And so they type in the letters to try to fill it in. So this is a nice way for students to review course material, and it just feels a little bit more fun than just kind of a basic quiz saying, you know, what's the definition of this word? I get a lot of really positive feedback about materia from my students, and I actually have some survey results to show you uh, a little bit later. Another fairly simple um, activity is using polls. I know a lot of faculty now are using in-class clickers and in-class polling. We used in-class polling today. And so you might wonder, well, how can I do that online? Um, and Web Courses has actually built in this tool now where you can embed into any content page in Web Courses a poll. Um, and so I just took this right here is just a screenshot of a poll from one of my classes. It embeds this exact image into your page and so students can choose their answer, click the vote button, you can come in, click the view results button and it automatically just pops up the results for you. Um, and there's a really nice step-by-step -step guide on the CDL website. Um, our slides are available on the presentation web page if you want to come back to these later. I've also come up with some activities using the discussion tools on web courses. Um, and in particular, one that I really like is what I call role play discussions. And so it comes from this idea that role play or role immersion sometimes is the term that's used. These activities really encourage students to actively engage with their course material. Um, and so I was introduced to this topic by the book Minds on Fire by Mark Carnes. Um, Eric Main at the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning quite often does um, faculty groups uh, reading this book. I think he has one this fall coming up. So if you're interested, um, talk to Eric about that um, or just go buy the book and read it. It's a really good book. Um, but he talks about this idea of getting students to engage with material by taking on a role of someone else. Um, Mark Carnes himself is a historian, so he has them role play historical figures. Um, I will talk about an example of how I do it in psychology in just a minute. But 
one thing that I struggled with when I first started thinking about this idea was he talked about role plays with 20 students. And I said, I have 125 students. How am I going to do that? And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I can make smaller discussion groups on web courses. And so I create a set of characters, and then I just create multiple groups. And so every group has one of each character that I've created, and each group just interacts with the, their other group mates. So it doesn't matter that I actually have 10 people playing the same role because they're playing that role in 10 different groups. Um, so you assign each group member a character to play, and then you give them some kind of an issue to discuss or a problem to solve kind of in character. Um, I did want to mention I do use multiple due dates with this because on web courses, um, students have a tendency to um, try to log in once and do all of their work for a week or two all at one time and then never come back. And so then that means discussions kind of lag. So I set multiple due dates and I say you have to by this date make your first post, then you have to come back by this date make a second post and so on. And so the way I do this in my abnormal psychology class is um, in this class we're talking about a variety of different mental disorders and then we also talk about treatment options. And so in that class in my discussion groups I have half of the students in a group um, portraying individuals with mental illness and then half of the people in the group portray different types of clinicians like a family therapist or a cognitive behavioral therapist or a psychiatrist. And so they interact with each other as clinicians and clients. Um, for that course, I rotate the roles every two weeks so that people get the opportunity to be different types of clients and different types of clinicians over the course of the semester. But you can also do it where people would be in the same role for the whole semester or, or for a longer period of time. Another activity that I do in the discussion group format is what I call You're the Professor. And this is where I have students engage with the course material by trying to come up with their own multiple choice test questions. Um, I got this idea from Anne Gleig, who's in the psych uh, philosophy department. Um, and I, we have a link to her UCF faculty focus article about this on our web page for this presentation. Um, but uh, this, again, I use the small groups. I ask students to come in and post five multiple choice questions that they've created based on the course material. Then there's another deadline where students have to respond to someone else's questions, give what they think the correct answers are. And then a third deadline where the students have to come back and kind of grade the responses that someone else gave and let them know if their answers were right or wrong, explain where to find the correct information. So again, this just gets students more engaged with the material than just reading the textbook or listening to a lecture. And then one um, final note that I wanted to um, encourage you to think about is to come up with assignments where you're asking students to apply course material. That's something that I've really worked hard to develop for my online classes, but certainly you could do this for face-to-face -face or mixed-mode classes as well. You want to think about how can the students apply this course material to real life, either through case examples of things that they might see in the future when they're working in the field, or even if there's a way to apply the concepts to their own lives. That can be very helpful for students. So an example of how I do this is I teach a course called Contemporary Behavior Therapy. And so I've created a set of assignments called Behavior Therapy in Practice. And so in those assignments, I give them examples. You know, imagine you have a client who's afraid of riding in elevators. Using the therapeutic techniques we've talked about, how would you develop a treatment plan to help this person deal with their fear of elevators, overcome their fear, for example. And so the students also really like these assignments because it makes it more real. It helps them think about what kind of work they might actually be doing in the future um, and helps them see how what we're talking about really applies. So as I mentioned, um, I really like using surveys. Again, you can make them anonymous. You can make them non-graded. And so um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago during the midterm in my courses this semester, I put up a short survey for my classes. And so I asked them for some feedback about these assignments. And so the first question I asked was for each of these different kinds of assignments, I said, did this assignment help you learn the course material? 
And so the blue bars are those who said strongly agree or agree. The yellow bars are those who just responded neutral. And then the green bars are the ones that reported disagree or strongly disagree. And so you can see for all of these assignments, materia, the role play discussion, the you or the professor discussion, and for that behavior therapy and practice application assignment, overwhelmingly the students said either strongly agree or agree that these assignments did help them learn the course material. And then I also asked them the question, should I use this assignment again in the future? And again, overwhelmingly, the students said yes. Again, the blue bars are yes, the yellow bars are maybe, and the green bars are no. Um, and so over half of the responses, and I got about a 50% response rate to this survey, um, and over half of the responses were positive that yes, these assignments should be given in the future. So just some thoughts to leave you with as you think about creating your own active learning activities for your classes. Um, first of all, really think about what it is that you want your students to know or to be able to do when they leave your class and try to design assignments that will assess that, that will get them practice in trying to, to give you that information or do those things. And then second, use technology to help you. As I've said, there's some really great resources here at UCF that build right into web courses that can make it actually very easy to do a lot of these things. Um, again, here at UCF, we have to think about scale. So you have to think about what you can reasonably grade. And you know, we all have great ideas for 20-page papers that we could have our students write, but I can't grade 125 20 page papers. Um, maybe you can, but I know I can't. So I have to think about what is going to be manageable for me in terms of grading as well. And then finally, be creative. For me, that's been really one of the best parts about teaching online is it forced me to step outside of that box of just lecturing and giving multiple choice tests. And so I started to get really creative about my assignments, and I think students really enjoy that too, that ability to be creative in terms of what they're giving to me. So one last poll, if you don't mind, we're going to do a little word cloud here. So just type in one or two words of things that you're taking away from today to, um, to help us generate a little word cloud about active learning online. Thank you. So, all right. Thank you very much, Jessica and Anchali. Um, we'll leave the poll up here, so feel free to keep responding to that. I see lots of people hard at work on their phones putting their responses in. So while everyone here is working on that, um, we can take a couple questions from our online audience as we move into the Q&A session. Um, we had a few come in during the session, so we can address those. Yep, no. So OK, so we had one question that was pretty early on. And someone asked, what active learning strategies are best for asynchronous courses besides games and self-assessment? I know you addressed a little bit more of those since, but I don't know if you want to, either one of you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I th well, I think a lot of the things, really all of the things that I talked about, like polls, and um, uh, small group discussions. Those are all things that I use all the time in my um, online classes that are asynchronous. Discussion is always a good one. And I just read an article this morning about how to use discussion even better, even more effective for online classes. So I think discussion is still in mm -hmm. for online as asynchronous. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Another question that came in was, can Dr. Namporn Chai elaborate on why lecture doesn't work in online teaching? I teach master's level online programs and lectures and, and lectures is the norm in the face-to-face -face class. I'm reading this verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I wonder if the lecture works online for the person also, I would love to learn. I mean, I just, from what I understand, the person was just saying that they t they use lecture in the fix to fix, but now it's online and the person is still using it. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. We can see if they respond with any uh, any additional follow up. But mm. well, 
Absolutely, because the research shows show us that long lecture usually does not work for the online education because it really put the student into the passive learner mode mm -hmm. and um, they really lost attention when they have to go through an hour or two hour lecture. And so we usually recommend that if you have the lecture, chunk them into a uh, small pieces, maybe five minutes a piece, or not over ten minutes, that sort of thing. Some some instructor, however, actually can elaborate things, explain, and use stories in their lecture. And it might go for twenty minutes, but it it feels like five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so it also depends too on uh, the style and the content. Awesome. And she did actually say, yes, that was my question. So that is correct. So <laughs> awesome. Thank you for addressing that. <laughs> so that was actually the only two that we had online. And so for our online audience, we're going to conclude the session there. So I would just like to quickly thank Jessica and Anchali before we move into the extended Q&A for our on-site participants. So thank you. Thank you.